Hi. Hi. So we're back again to answer some of the questions that came in um, through email or that we didn't really feel like we answered enough on the webinar. And here we go. We'll start with Laura who sent in a question from New Hampshire. Do you compost? And if so, what type of composting system are you using in a small space? So I'll, I'll take that one because composting is one of the things I like doing. And first, when we started out, we did all, we've done the whole gamut of composting. One is hot composting, where I just created a heap um, on the ground, nothing except the tarp covering it, a mountain that was about four feet high of my, that started four feet high with my um, carbons, which is lots of leaf matter and dried uh, paper or dried, dried leaves basically and then, and nitrogen. So that would be matter that would be like your food scraps, your, um, your plants that are still alive. Um, but that ratio of carbon to nitrogen is- 25 to one. 25 to one. So that means tw you're having a lot more carbon than nitrogen in the system. The nitrogen kind of acts as the fuel to kind of burn down the carbon and break it up. So that's in essence the formula for any compost bin. Um, and even I guess that you want to achieve. So that you want to achieve, if you want to achieve um, a finished product that's balanced, you want to keep that ratio of carbon to nitrogen 25 to 1. And so that's in a large space though. Generally, if you're not generating a lot of waste or the you have a smaller space where, where you want to keep your compost and we recommend there's two systems that are smaller one is a uh, you do worm composting it's also called vermicomposting or bokashi so worm composting or vermicomposting uses the red wriggler isenia fetida worm and that can be purchased online you may have local vendors as well that you could uh, source from we cultivate our own worms now we've purchased them and they are in a bucket um, we feed them the food scraps but we also try to keep that ratio not all food scraps feeding them paper as well worms can live off of just paper alone and that keeps it pretty balanced whereas if it's too wet if your food is too um, acidic then that can lead to anaerobic problems in your in your worm bin which should be um, primarily anaerobic aerobic process. There is a kind of worm, uh, there is a kind of composting called bokashi, which is a fermentation process and that is anaerobic. So the, the advantage of using the bokashi is that it, you can put anything like citrus peels or bones in there, uh, which you can't really do that in a, in a worm composting uh, system. So the, the, the thing with bokashi though is it, it doesn't you won't get finished compost out of that. It's great because it seals the odors in and it gradually breaks things down over a few uh, month or two. But then it's kind of like a pre-compost. So then you would add that to a, another compost pile to kind of finish the compost. You could also bury the bokashi after it's, it's done breaking down the bones and things and it will naturally compost much faster. And finally, if you choose to you can invest in a tumbler system so we try not not to use the tumblers that are plastic just because we those eventually will break down faster than the ones that are metal and so far the ones that are metal have worked very well for us so we have a jora form and another composter made in the u.s that i, I can't remember the name of but was do donated to me by a teacher uh, very sturdy big composting bins that really uh, can take all of the food scraps that eight people can produce in our household. The advantage of the metal ones also is that uh, it keeps animals out of the compost. If you're in an urban or suburban area, then you have to worry about um, small animals that might get into your compost bin. We've even had a, a hawk that got into our compost bin. So In a pallet. Yeah, in a so wired mesh. The metal will... will if you're, if you're worried about small animals getting your compost, then I would definitely recommend taking a look at the, the metal composters. Eleonora asks, what can I use to prevent pest 
worms eating leaves of my vegetable plants. They chewed all my cauliflower plant. That was last fall, and she lives in Ashburn, I believe, Virginia. So, so cauliflower is a brassica, and uh, it's highly likely that the two there's a, there's a limited number of pests that will target specifically brassicas. So, one of them that it's it's likely if it's a worm, it's probably something called a cabbage looper or cabbage worm. It's these um, green kind of fat looking worms. They start off very small. Um, they start off, the, there's these white moths, cabbage moths that you'll see. They they're, they're, uh, look a little bit like butterflies, but they're smaller and they're white. And they come in the spring and the fall and they'll lay eggs on the underside of the leaves of the brassicas. And then these cabbage worms uh, hatch and they they get fatter as they eat the leaves, so they have a huge appetite. It's kind of like Eric Carle's uh, caterpillar, <laughs> hungry, caterpillar. hungry Caterpillar, where they're just, before you know it, they can totally chew down all the leaves of your, your brassicas. So the, the best thing I recommend for that is if you catch them early, then you can pick them off. They're, they're very slow, so it's quite easy to uh, see them. So you kind of have to be diligent for that. The other thing is that you can use row cover, uh, like a breathable row cover that you would cover only during those two seasons to, to protect your uh, brassica plants. If it's not that, the other main culprit of the brassica family are these harlequin beetles. They're um, very brightly colored black and red beetles. They also feed on okra and a few other plants, but their, their main preference is to attack uh, brassicas. The, the main thing to do then is you want to kind of isolate that plant because they have a tendency to, um, their numbers will soar if you let them to breed, allow them to breed. So when they lay eggs on the underside of the leaves, they kind of look like these tiny little drums, black and white drums, so you have to be really uh, vigilant looking for these little drums on the leaves and removing those. Physically squashing them, soaping them out down. Um, we have little kids and I need something that's low maintenance to try to grow out the first time. I can plant something if it can do the work. I'm impatient. What crops do you recommend? This is Michalina. I think she's here around the Maryland, D.C., Virginia area as well. I would always go for legumes because they come in with their own built-in fertilizer. And so anything that's a legume is peas or beans, anything from that family are bound to be easy to grow and rewarding right away. So right now, I would say in our climate in Virginia, the weather, if you plant peas now, unless they're already this high, they will have either a very short season um, because they will fry soon enough when they're big and producing the flowers in the summer. So you might want to, instead of doing that, start your beans now. And that, But if you live in the upper latitudes, then you can still sow your peas and probably get a good harvest. Yeah, I would say um, in terms of, you're looking for things that germinate really quickly and grow really fast. So, like Nikki mentioned, legumes are a great choice. Um, you could also try sunflowers. That's, a, that's kind of a, a very thing. rewarding, fun thing because the plants themselves get really large. So for kids, that's very impressive. You get these eight foot tall, huge head things. Um, trying to think of other super easy things to grow. Radishes. Radishes are 30 days to grow, so that's pretty rewarding to um, squirrels, birds, and chipmunks. How do we keep the hypothetical crop safe from nature's thieves? Um, so I showed a few pictures of ways that our GIY members were using to, to protect their crops. And maybe if I can edit this film, I will post them here or attach them to the email. Then we, we can cover them with a wire mesh. You can create some sort of a box on top of your raised beds that are covered in, in wire mesh and, and easily you can detach and attach the sides. You can use cloches as well. We have GIY members doing that. And um, the other thing is a trap crop. 
So there's a, a lot depends on your specific varmints. <laughs> so uh, you have to kind of look at their personalities as well, because one solution doesn't always fit work Everything. for every uh, person. Just like for each person, it's not one person solution that works. Person is unique. Each chipmunk yeah. is unique. <laughs> so the, there are other things like you can. Uh, Squirrels will generally just dig in your beds, but if there's a, a trap crop that has something that they prefer to nibble on, uh, like sunflowers, then they're going to go after that instead and kind of ignore digging around in your beds. Um, you can also, with chipmunks, because they're low to the ground, you can uh, put uh, hot pepper kind of around the exterior, like crushed dry pepper around the exterior of your raised beds. and. Uh, we've heard some good results from that as well. Yes, and the final question is what are the best vegetables that grow well in containers rather than in the ground? Uh, I think most vegetables will grow better always, always in the ground than in containers as I explained in the webinar. And so watch the webinar replay <laughs> to, to find out exactly why that is. But if you are going to grow in containers, then you would probably choose plants that have shallow roots, like certain herbs will have shallow roots, not all herbs, but then if you do, well, most herbs will do well in containers. Another thing that I would suggest growing is looking for the varieties that are very short. So if you do a bean, uh, you won't, you wouldn't choose a bean that is a vining pole bean, you would choose one that's a bush bean. So there are different varieties of those. Or um, if you were to do strawberries, which you very well can, you would uh, choose maybe the alpine or the smaller peppers, the smaller vari varieties of peppers. Tomatoes, you would, you would choose the cherry tomatoes because they will, uh, that are determinate, not indeterminate, which means they just grow forever. Um, so it's all about variety. I think you can also be uh, highly successful if you have slightly larger containers yeah. with with dwarf fruit trees. So um, these these could be like dwarf peaches, dwarf uh, uh, apples. There are these things called columnar apples that are very small that just have a single uh, main branch, mm. and they produce the fruit along that main branch, mm. and the, the branch. The main trunk only gets four or five feet tall, and then you can even grow things like pomegranates or figs, which we're uh, doing in pots right in now. In pots in Northern Virginia, they do super yeah. well. So that's it. We hope that you enjoy this quick Q and A, and if you'd like to learn more about how we can help you, please check out grow growmyownfood.com/giy, which is our program. Grow it yourself. Uh, we hope to see you in that program so we can get to know you and your garden situation more and help you grow abundantly this year.